World Watchers International originates at KLRB, Carmel, California. Here's May. Good evening. This is May Brussel in Carmel, California, and this is broadcast number 522, December the 6th, 1981. In two more nights, it will be the anniversary of the murder of John Lennon, and at first I was going to spend one hour uh, talking about who killed John Lennon on this particular broadcast. But as I accumulated the material that I've set aside over the past year and added it to the other research on the assassination teams that have been doing this kind of work successfully for a long, long time, and particularly going right back to John Kennedy's assassination, it may be that I will do a four-part series on who killed John Lennon starting this evening and then December the 13th and the 20th and the 27th right up to the due year. And if you listen very carefully, and you can send for the printed sheets that accompany this tapes if you don't tape it off the air, if you listen very carefully and get the names and places, you will see the pattern, what I call the recipe, the umbrella for the political assassinations. And into this interlocking team, I will place Mark David Chapman and the moving of John Lennon up to the time that he was killed at the Dakota in New York City and how he was trapped and killed at that time. I will put aside some of the important stories in the news that pertain to this, but I don't want to spend time on them now. One is Ronald Reagan's unleashing the CIA in the United States, turning it loose on us, just as it was happening up to the time of the Watergate exposures. I don't even want to spend time talking about that invasion of Gaddafi's people into the United States to kill the president. I believe that being as the CIA trained Gaddafi's assassination teams. We taught them how to blow up the airplanes and to do the terrorism so successfully they could do a job identical to the same one they did in Egypt where they left Ghazal and Mubarak on either side of Sadat dead and they killed Sadat with the 28 bullets right to the heart. Uh, it would be easy to blow up the President of the United States and keep Alexander Haig and George Bush surviving. After all, Reagan didn't cooperate in March and dropped dead when Hinckley uh, shot at him. John Hinckley hasn't even been tried, if that wasn't a clear-cut case. And we've spent 400000 so far just letting him linger. And we're going to change the U.S. attorney there, Howard Ruff, and manipulate the courts and have a dummy trial, as we've had in all these assassination trials or assassination attempts. Uh, I don't give a bit of credence to this ridiculous thing that Gaddafi himself would tackle the United States. We take such big countries and uh, have so much bravado to go after them. And, and if anybody comes here who says he comes from Gaddafi, he was trained by the Central Intelligence Agency. And the vice president of the United States was director of the CIA. I want to talk some more later on the Patty Hearst book that's coming out. I wrote that book, uh, story, book length, The SLA is the CIA. Patty tells in this new book how she drove the getaway car and Emily Harris killed a woman at the Carmichael Bank. Uh, this the government's known, the FBI has known for years, but they will not prosecute Emily Harris who killed this woman because the SLA is the CIA. Emily Harris came from the Indiana State Police and Narcotic Agencies and worked with the Defense Intelligence and uh, they set up this little gang in 1972 to 74. So Patty can say that she drove a getaway car and Emily killed a woman. So what? Uh, wives are cheap and so much for that. I will add in a few weeks the material I have on William Holden, the murder of William Holden and the death of Natalie Wood, the relationship or interrelationship of the two. The one I know was a top-level spy, William Holden. And there's a lot of more material coming in on Natalie Wood and there was this close link of their associates and so forth. And then I will talk about the new super spy agency, larger than Interpol, bigger than Intertel, that's opening offices, international offices, right next door to the CIA. Now, the CIA has a few government restrictions that the international private organizations don't have to obey. Therefore, um, they can have their office next door. And the man who's heading this new super agency comes directly out of the offices of John J. McCloy in New York. John J. McCloy was the person who unleashed the major Nazi war criminals after World War II to start arming their uh, Gestapo techniques all over the world. He was on the Warren Commission. 
He has been much of the setting up the OPEC, the Seven Sisters, so that we got strangled by the oil profits and the oil intrigues. John J. McCloy praised the uh, people that were locked up in the Japanese internment camps. He was, had a role in that. He thought that was great during the last war. Uh, out of that office comes the new director for a new spy agency. So there's a lot going on in the news, but I do want to talk about uh, John Lennon because the murder of John Lennon is part of a much larger fabric that has affected all of us for years, and he was just one more victim. Along with uh, Richard Allen, and I'm going to go into the relationships of Richard Allen to Mark David Chapman and the Lennon murder, along with him is the three-part, that horrible uh, Mr. Casey of the CIA, William Casey and Richard Allen, have had such a part with William Colby and Richard Helms, former directors of the CIA, and also George Bush, of continuing the murders and continuing the cover-ups. The Senate can't fire them. As I said before, they're in there sort of doing a dance to the end. Each one has so much on the other. This last week, there was an investigation of William Casey, and one article of the Washington Post is titled, the CIA chief is not unfit to serve. No raving records. Another story says Senate panel says CIA chief failed to disclose investments and his liabilities. The certain countries that he controls, like Indonesia or Korea, is, they're called his clients. They're actually his countries. Another one, Casey's record raises concern on the panel. And another top front page story, Senate probers give CIA chief poor ratings. Now, when you're giving an institution $22 billion and every secret that they can possibly have, and they can open our mail and tap our phones and break up organizations, they're outright admitting that they've got a crook on their hands. They, they don't know how to unload him, but they don't even have a decent adjective to describe him. And Richard Allen and William Casey are really bad trouble. There were two cartoons this week about Richard Allen that sort of describe the story. One is the White House, and there's a large tree enveloping it, and it's very much like the old Watergate cartoons that came along. And it says the Allen scandal in this huge uh, encasement of, like, oak trees or large trees is swallowing the whole White House. And Nancy is speaking, and there's a, a little message coming out of the window, and she says, but Ronnie, it started out as just a little Japanese bonsai. And I do believe the Japanese bonsai could be the Regan Gate. Any one of these characters, they're so rotten, could be the Regan Gate if we follow it and keep following it, just as was done with Watergate. Another cartoon, a coffin, the Allen case, and a man very pleased standing up at the microphone saying, you can go home now, the services are over, we've finished the investigation. And then it has a team of about eight people upside down and fighting each other, digging the grave out and looking for more and not settling that the case has been rested. And that's the Richard Allen probe. Uh, it's apropos of researching uh, Richard Allen and the John Lennon case and updating that story that Nancy Regan came out with one of her priceless remarks this week. Nancy's theory on drug abuse, in case any of you haven't read it, uh, Washington Post, big story, music blamed for drug abuse. Nancy Regan on Friday cited contemporary music and humor as the way that youth get their message that the illegal use of drugs is socially acceptable. And she, again, is harping like they did for eight years when they were out here in California, the rock musicians, and what are we going to do with our children? Now, Nancy's become a great expert on drugs, you understand. She had Frank Sinatra at the inaugural ball putting up the entertainment with all of his links to Carlos Marcello and Sam Giacon and a mile long of crime figures. And now uh, at Caesar's World that, that is involved with crime and scandal and they can't even get a license. They're being kicked out of New Jersey if they don't get rid of their uh, head for the Caesar's World. I mentioned that last week. Uh, Nancy has traveled around. She's spending New Year's Eve at the Annenbergs down in Palm Springs. Now, rock music causes drug abuse, you understand. Nothing like the Annenbergs and the mob figures that have been touted around Washington uh, since the day John Kennedy was killed. Lyndon Johnson and uh, Richard Nixon and Jimmy Carter and Gerald Ford and Ronald Reagan are nothing but drug kings or mafia kings. And she has the nerve to blame rock music. 
They were put in by the medical lobbies, by the AMA, the Quaaludes, the, the, all the Tylenols, you name it, all the medical pharmaceutical concerns, the Pepsi-Cola people, the Coca-Cola people, and all of their gang and their appointments, all of Ronald Reagan's appointments, have been mob characters. Some he got away with and some he didn't. I'd like to do one night on just the mob connected people to Ronald Reagan at this moment, now that he's president, not before. They can't cling up their act. But that Nancy Reagan has such nerve, such unmitigated nerve. If a woman had balls, I'd say she had them. I mean, to absolutely blame rock music for drug abuse and for the children getting upset about rock music. But that's their scapegoat because their real fear is that the message, she uses the word the message, the Young people not only get the message of drugs in music, they get political messages and they get messages of truth, similar to Mad Magazine. She complains that their humor is also bad for them. She's right that it's bad. And also, while she's complaining about rock music and the kids, there was a picture of Nancy in a publication this week. America's first lady may get a collection of jewels fit for a queen. A jewel or a multi-million dollar collection it was made up mostly of diamonds, rubies, sapphires, pearls, and gold that she could wear on state occasions, donated by a diamond dealer. You can better believe that that diamond dealer touches bases with some dope dealers. You, what do you want to bet that the stones that she wears or borrowed to go to Prince Charles' wedding weren't some way related to all the dope dealing people they know? This article says her collection would be donated by jewel dealers and corporations and wealthy friends of the Regans. Their taxes would be tax deductible. So the taxpayer eventually would do it. It wouldn't go into the general till of the taxes. They'd get the deduction. And she could wear these lovely jewels as a picture of, again, with a crown. And she would have a million-dollar set of a diamond ruby necklace, brooch, ring, and choker. I don't know if they mean to wear a choker or whether the diamonds will choke her, but it's so disgusting. The news is so disgusting. And now getting to Richard Allen and John Lennon, who murdered John Lennon. There was an article in the paper this morning, the many changes since John Lennon was murdered. And there were two interesting things in the San Francisco Examiner Chronicle. One was the policeman who was on the spot the moment that John Lennon was murdered. And he had an interview, and he said... Uh, the defense tried to make out that Mark David Chapman was crazy, a schizoid, out of touch with reality. He said, a wacko? Not in my book, and I've dealt with plenty of them. He wasn't talking to the walls. He wasn't hearing voices. When we got to the police station, he called his wife. He told her to get a doctor for his mother, and he told her to call the cops for her protection and not to call in the press. I couldn't believe that that guy was so rational. And the other thing that was interesting about the article today was that books are being planned about John and Yoko, but the important one is going to put out, be put out by Rolling Stone magazine, edited by Jacqueline Kennedy Onassis. And I'll have more to say in the next few weeks on the uh, Jackie Onassis-Yoko Ono connection, because I really have never trusted it. I don't like it, and uh, um, they're evidently going to put out a book. Jackie is going to edit the book on John and Yoko. And you know what I think. If you haven't known me a long time, you can guess what I'm thinking. And if you've listened to me for years, you know pretty well what I think about that connection. Now, last week I was talking about Richard Allen, how he met Ronald Reagan at Blair House on the 19th, the day before the inauguration, that the people that came over from Japan the entourage met Ronald Reagan at the Blair House on the 19th. The inauguration was on the 20th. They took some pictures of Nancy Reagan on the 21st and flew home. And knowing the kind of greasy fingers Reagan has or Richard Nixon and the kind of wheeling dealing they could do, something went on at Blair House that had more to do with than the picture taking. Uh, some kind of an operation was going. I'm sure that the day after the inauguration or the day before the inauguration, the president of General Motors or Ford or Chrysler or American car companies were not there. Representatives of Toyota and Datsun were there, and they were meeting with Ronald Reagan on the 19th. But the story gets worse than that, and because it's worse than that, 
I decided uh, in doing the story on John Lennon to make an overlay of the career of Richard Allen because he set up this meeting. And the one interesting fact about the decision of this controversial Allen story that is bringing the White House down and causing these cartoons in every paper and a mountain of articles, these are the dates that are of interest. On December the 7th, the people that Richard Allen had known for a long time called him and said, we're coming to Washington. That was the initial contact. You can write that down, December the 7th. On December the 8th, they sent a two-page memo to make way for their interview with Ronald Reagan. It was a two-page memo on December the 8th saying that uh, two-paragraph memo to Ronald Reagan, and it went to Charles Tyson, who is now on the National Security Council. He was a staffer of Allen's, and the memo went to Ronald Reagan and in charge of Charles Tyson of the National Security Council. Now, what happened on December the 8th? The, the introduction or the opening came on the 7th. On December the 8th, they said, we're coming to see Reagan. Well, in case you don't remember, December the 8th was the day that John Lennon was delivered and packaged before the inauguration, and Ronald Reagan didn't have to contend with his kind. He was dead and in his coffin by, uh, well, actually he was cremated, but December the 8th was that day. Then they came to Washington, D.C. on the 18th. This party arrived on the 15th. And this isn't the party that just happened to want an interview. I'm going into the background of Allen and then into Mark David Chapman. He had known these people from, there's two controversial dates, one from 1970 and the other was from 1966 when they were both at the Hoover Institute in Palo Alto, California. Heavy in espionage, Defense Department work, counterintelligence, and so forth. They arrived in Washington January the 15th, and they met January the 18th with Richard Allen. And at that time, Richard Allen received what is described as a big present. There was an article in the L.A. Times that this meeting over at the uh, Blair House was a big present. And when the present is told, according to the newspaper reports, then we will know the truth of the Richard Allen story. That was in the Los Angeles Times this week, November the 28th. It said, according to a wire service report from Tokyo, the newspaper said in a front page story that the Allen investigation will enter the final stage when the American investigators find out what the big present was. The big present was given to Richard Allen January the 18th by Professor Tamatsu Takasi the husband of one of the women who interviewed Mrs. Regan. And that big present was on the uh, was delivered on the 18th. And then it was on the 19th that they went to see Ronald Regan alone, not Nancy. And the 20th was the inauguration, and the 21st was the picture. According to an article in the Washington Post, the picture was uh, just the day after the inauguration. They finally met with Mrs. Regan. The representatives, according to Alan, finally met. Well, you can believe finally. They've been working on this December the 7th, the 8th, the 15th, the 18th, the 19th. Now, the 21st, they finally meet Mrs. Regan. There was a cute, confused five to seven minute session on January the 21st. As the Regans were walking downstairs to a reception, there were photos. There were three questions, and then the Japanese people left. An envelope was handed. One of the people uh, they don't know who it was. Maybe Mrs. Takasi thrust some papers in the hand of Allen, and he turned them over to somebody else. And that's a chronology. We don't know yet what the big present was. But a few days before uh, the inauguration, Allen got his gift. Not talking about the watches and not talking about the check. This is something else. Now, before John Lennon was murdered, on December the 7th, that would happen to be a Sunday night. He was murdered Monday night. On tape number 470, uh, the broadcast in general title was called, Do We Learn from the Lessons of History? And one of the things that I have on the printed sheet, if you don't have that tape or you want ordered, it was the night before Lennon was killed. This is what I had on the sheet that accompanies the tape that I had on KLRB. The assassination teams 
from the early 60s are all in their place. If not part of the murder, these men are all part of the cover-up. And I listed the people who, and I later said earlier, as a matter of fact, had said were hard on the rock musicians and were part of the team that had killed John Kennedy, Robert Kennedy, Martin Luther King, Malcolm X, Salvador Allende, Janis Joplin, Lenny Bruce, you name it, uh, rock stars, rock musicians, and John Lennon. The, he, Lennon wasn't even dead till the next night, and these are the people I listed, and in the next uh, few weeks, I'll continue to show their role in this uh, particular affair. One was Ronald Reagan, the other was Ed Davis from the Los Angeles Police Department, who's now a senator in California, Arlen Specter of the Warren Commission, who's now a senator in Washington, who's pushing a judge for a, a U.S. judge in Philadelphia who is under a lot of questionable acceptance of large fees from lawyers who uh, present cases in front of his court. Evel Younger, who always lauded, he attacked uh, the rock musicians, and he and Ed Davis were part of a larger FBI, CIA operation in Los Angeles, and Younger was DA when Robert Kennedy was killed down there in Los Angeles. And Regan was governor, and Ed Davis was chief of police. I mentioned Paul Laxalt, and he plays an important part in this. John J. McCloy, that's the fellow who, the attorney for Jackie Onassis, the attorney whose office, the young lawyer is setting up this counterintelligence operation in Washington. Richard Nixon, who goes right back to the Allen days. Gerald Ford, who was the Japanese government, gave a million dollars towards his uh, library in Michigan. John Connolly, Richard Allen, I mentioned the night before Lennon was murdered, Howard Baker, he, he's one who took the Japanese contingent to, uh, Richard Allen took them to meet uh, Howard Baker in Washington, D.C., and Tip O'Neill, who was very close to Park, uh, Tonsung Park and the Korea Gate operation. And I listed the agents from the CIA, the DIA, and National Security Agency, that's Richard Allen and the same people that received the letter from Japan were coming to see Ronald Reagan. The night before John Lennon was murdered, I had listed those people who right now can fit into an overall picture of who killed John Lennon, and the next evening, Lennon was dead. There were articles this week in the newspaper uh, that I'm sure pertain to Mr. Allen. They come from Japan. One says... Nissan chief rejects the cut in auto imports, or exports rather, that they said they have to maintain their quota. They will not cut the quota. They went there, the Japanese automakers, at a time when American cars are going bankrupt through their own fault, not through the Japanese fault. Uh, we make these big gas guzzlers. But there they are at Blair House before the inauguration, after the inauguration, meeting with Alan, meeting with uh, Ronald Reagan and the, these papers today say they reject the cuts in auto uh, exports. They maintain they need the quota to the U.S. and they call this a matter of life or death that would be impossible. We flatly reject. And I think one reason that the reports of the Allen case and the big money are coming from the Japanese police is that Allen and Reagan reneged on the pacification of the Japanese by probably telling them they could have what they wanted with the car imports. Another article this week, Japanese are deserving of more patience. This is Mike Mansfield, our ambassador to Tokyo, saying soften your approach to Japan. And what he really means is if we keep hitting them on producing more weapons and uh, curtailing their cars or their computers, they will spill the beans because a good share of the American counterintelligence, the SLA operations, the Nugan Han operations, the Wells Fargo scandal is interwoven with the Japanese mafia and the Japanese relationships to our central intelligence agency. We've used that country and those agents so strongly that if we turn down the products they're selling, they we can counteract and leak stories as they are about Allen. And if we give in to them that our own motor cars go bankrupt as they are doing and uh, uh, then people will storm the White House and say what is happening. An article this week, General Motors lay off of 13,000 in Detroit. 
the uh, 13,000 people just this last week in Detroit, and all of the motor companies are having trouble. Now, the night before John Kennedy was assassinated, Richard Nixon, who plays a big part in the Richard Allen story, uh, Richard Nixon was in Dallas, Texas, at the home of Mr. Merchinson and Clint Merchinson. They all had a role in the Kennedy assassination. J. Edgar Hoover was there. The Pepsi-Cola bosses were there that Richard Nixon worked with and Ronald Reagan worked with. And the Pepsi-Cola offices shared Warner Lambert in uh, New York City. The I talked about the Nazi Galen chief who worked with our Defense Department and set up our spy system in this country with money from around the world going down to South America. This Otto von Bolschwing uh, came out of the offices of Elmer Bobst and Warner Lambert, the co-office, the Pepsi-Cola people. And Richard Nixon was down it with his clients as a lawyer, allegedly, in Dallas, Texas, the night before John Kennedy was assassination. I've referred to that meeting many times. It was written up in Penn Jones' third volume of Forgive My Grief on page 84. The head man was in Dallas, and it tells about Richard Nixon and leaving the airport uh, the morning that Kennedy was killed, November 22, 1963. And I think the November 22nd, 21st, 1963 meeting of Richard Nixon and Clint Merchinson and J. Edgar Hoover and the top people that were going to be behind the murder of John Kennedy and the murder of John Kennedy, November 22nd, 1963, isn't much different than the approach to Richard Allen on December the 7th, uh, opening up a uh, conversation, we want to come to you, and December the 8th, it's given to Ronald Reagan and the National Security Advisors. These are a treacherous gang, but they're a consistent gang, and you can pretty well almost guess their next moves. Now, on uh, 1980, November the 2nd, 1980, this was about a month before John Lennon was killed. I had said on KLRB, on that sheet that goes with the tape, the Regan advisors are linked to Japanese auto industry, and this is about Richard Allen getting 100000 a year from Dotson, and meeting with Robert Vesco, the international organized crime figure who headed up assassination teams. I was saying on KLRB a year ago and a month before Lennon was killed that not only did Richard Allen work for Japanese automotive companies, but he had other reasons for money or big gifts to be transacted besides the uh, import quota on cars. And I mentioned that Richard Allen worked with the top organized crime and assassination teams. And I might add that Robert Vesco works with Frank Turpel and George Carcole and Edwin Wilson and Theodore Shackley. The assassination teams that were formed after the Bay of Pigs that killed John Kennedy and then set up Air America in Australia and carried heroin and assassination business uh, up through tomorrow they're still working as far as you can tell by the headlines they're still maybe going to come in and take care of Reagan and blame Gaddafi they're still at work but I said a year ago and uh, less one month that Richard Allen worked both for Dotson and Robert Vesco and the assassination teams he also worked in 1972 as an agent in for Portugal uh, covering up a massacre in Mozambique and a third broadcast that I had on uh, this station, on World Watchers, was November the 2nd, 1980, the other part of the story of Alan. And the subject was, the rock musicians will have a hard time when the Ronald Reagan administration gets into office. And I referred to various uh, people that had died, and I said that, that this is what I had on the sheet of the broadcast that particular week, was about the rock star Paul Kantner, who had a stroke, the founder of the Jefferson Starship, who was about to make a new album. And I mentioned that there was going to be a new kind of inauguration party. Uh, I didn't know about Alan's guests and the meetings of Ronald Reagan at that time, that it was going to be set up by John Warner, Secretary of the Navy, that the arrangements for the inauguration. And John Warner is closely associated with Edwin Wilson, who heads the assassination teams. So I had the right names, and they've been moving around all year, but I uh, knew they would be hard on the rock musicians, and Lennon died a month later after that broadcast, and I had the names of the people involved, like Richard Allen, the assassination teams, 
and John Warner, and that involves Frank Turpel and Edwin Wilson and uh, the co-partners in safe houses in Virginia. So a year ago, I was calling the shots before the gun went off, and on the second half of this broadcast this evening, I'm going to do uh, a little more on Richard Allen, or quite a bit, before we get to Mark David Chapman, the fellow that killed John Lennon, and show you the interweaving of the two and how their agencies and agents crossed. Now I'm going into the biography of Richard Allen and where his agents were at a particular time, as I say. Then I'll overlay uh, in the weeks to come Mark David Chapman and where he was. Uh, in summary, I was drawing charts of Edwin Wilson and Frank Turple. I did a broadcast a few weeks ago on Tursum and the group that was behind the murder of Anwar Sadat. They set up their offices uh, in Geneva, Switzerland, and in 1979 is when they were uh, doing their operation over there for uh, sending weapons to Sadat's enemies. Well, Mark David Chapman was in Geneva, Switzerland in 1978, and of course we don't know if he was in those same offices, but the characters that he met, the man that he met in Geneva, Switzerland, a David Moore in 1978 was the same David Moore that he worked with at Fort Chaffee, Arkansas. And when he was st at Fort Chaffee, Arkansas, the, at that time were brought in the Laotian tribesmen, the Mayo tribesmen, and the Vietnamese that Wilson and Turple and Theodore Shackley were bringing back from Southeast Asia. They were going to put them on the Turk Island for Robert Vesco to continue their narcotics traffic and uh, Nazi propaganda and so forth, so that the tribesmen and the people working with Robert Vesco and Edwin Wilson, who had the offices in Geneva, had uh, was bringing them to Fort Chaffee. That's where they were when Mark David Chapman was there in 1975 with David Moore. And then he's in Geneva, Switzerland with David Moore in 1978 at the same time Edwin Wilson and Frank Turple and Thomas Kleins of the CIA are working in Geneva, Will, uh, Geneva in Switzerland. Um, they had offices in Beirut, Lebanon, and I have a file. I'll be doing the Lebanon connections for you in Beirut, Lebanon, and Mark David Chapman was sent to Beirut, Lebanon uh, for six months. The connections of Beirut have to do with the uh, links to Chile, to the murder of Salvador Allende, to the Black September group, the radical group that claimed credit for killing the Jews at the Olympic Games in Munich, Germany. And Mark David Chapman was in Beirut uh, at the same place as where these people were for six months before he went to uh, Fort Chaffee. Uh, Edwin Wilson and Samuel Cummings, the arms merchant, uh, had safe houses in London and a lot of very fancy estates in London, England, where they keep refugees, and, and they were supposed to be for international people on the lam, like Robert Vesco. And Mark David Chapman was in London, where he was taken to a concert of John Lennon's. The Beatles had broken up before he flew back to Hawaii. He had a trip around the world where he was in Korea, and the Reverend Moon and the Koreans also have strong links to the Lebanon and Chilean connections. The Nugenhan Bank in Australia, that Task Force 157, um, the group that killed Allende and overthrew the government in Australia, had a travel office, and one of their offices was in Hawaii. And when Mark David Chapman came to Hawaii from Tennessee, from a Presbyterian church group in Tennessee, uh, he went to a travel office where a woman, a Japanese woman, set up his arrangements for that trip around the world, and when he came home, he married her. Uh, I have a lot on the two Japanese wives, the uh, Gloria Abe and Yoko Ono, and a lot of question marks on these two particular women under what I call the Japanese connection. But this travel office that was, that was set up at the Nugent Hand covered 16 countries, and one of them was Hawaii, and Chapman arrived in Hawaii and then took a trip around the world that included South Korea and China and Hong Kong and then Geneva, Switzerland, and London. So he covered the same pace, basis as the people I've been talking about all year. 
The Nugent Hand offices in Australia were linked to William Colby of the CIA and the murder of Frank uh, Nugent. Michael Hand is still alive. And Colby, at the same time, was a lobbyist for three corporations in Japan. When Frank Nugent died with William Colby's name on him, and he was his attorney, I have the names of different companies, and he's been a strong lobbyist, as has Richard Allen in Japan. Richard Allen has, he says, from five to nine clients in Japan, and I have a large section on the Japanese connections we'll go into. And one of them is the entire electric company of Japan, and I mentioned last week on this program the uh, Inner Progress, the CIA dummy front out of Washington that covered a large electric company in Japan that was linked to the Attorney General in California, and that was Evel Younger. Uh, so William Colby had one finger as an attorney for the Nugenhan Bank, which was completely CIA and heroin traffic that Vesco, Robert Vesco and Frank Turple were linked to, and they had Japanese uh, clients, William Colby, over in Japan as a lobbyist. And then the Japanese connection, there were two wives involved in this complicated web. One was Gloria Abe. Uh, a surrogate wife of a kind of Mark David Chapman. He, he went to the travel agency where she worked. Um, he wanted a trip around the world. She set it up for him. He came back from this glorious trip, like Korea, Japan, and so forth, the Southeast Asia and Geneva and London. And then she, in quotes, married him. Uh, his hobby was collecting expensive paintings. Some of you know, some you don't know. $8,700 for a Salvador Dali and a Rockwell. He had expensive art. Uh, no noticeable means of support, mind you, about $4 an hour here and there. But he collected expensive art and traveled. Um, the Nugent Hand Bank was closely linked to Frank Turple and Edwin Wilson. And uh, Frank Turple and Edwin Wilson worked also with Strom Thurmond, the man that the from the Senate who wanted to get um, uh, John Lennon out of this country. Uh, there's uh, proof or documentation of the Thurman connections uh, in one book. It's uh, the book, the biography of John Lennon. You can see a quotation. There's many other pieces of evidence. I have some uh, that have gotten been gotten from Freedom of Information Act. But in this one particular biography, it said that uh, John, John Lennon was to be gotten rid of, that Strom Thurmond sent a letter to John Mitchell in 1972 and was afraid that there would be demonstrations at the Republican National Convention. Well, if they were afraid of demonstrations in 72, you can bet they would be afraid of demonstrations in 1981 because Ronald Reagan was hell-bent and is hell-bent on war and they were afraid, I know, that John Lennon would surface and uh, come out, emerge again. He was going to reappear again. Um, Strom Thurmond wrote to John Mitchell, the Attorney General, it appears to me an important matter, and it is well to be considered at the highest, at the highest level, which would be above John Mitchell to the National Security Con uh, Council. Many headaches might be avoided if appropriate action be taken in time on John Lennon. Now that is the head of the judiciary. This is the way the justice works in the United States, the country of law and order. The senator in charge of the judiciary writes to the attorney general who ended up in prison with his striped suits, but and there is supposed to go to the highest level, which would be when he says the highest level above John would be the National Security Council who gives the permission for the hit and the killing. Headaches would be avoided if the appropriate action be taken in time. That was 1972. By 1975, they got off of Lennon's case because Watergate came. There were so many exposés, and they, they couldn't handle all the stories that were coming out. So after four years, there was a lot of appeal on the case. On October the 7th, 1975, they said John Lennon could stay in this country. Now, I'll go in with you later into the chronology again. I'll mention it now and repeat it later. John Lennon um, was traveling around the country. He picked up with a Chinese woman. He left Yoko for 18 months. Uh, he wasn't around her until after this time period, after he was accepted in this country. He went off on his own. And then he returns to Yoko at a time that is very crucial because 
she has him, sees him at an Elton John concert, sends him to a hypnotist, and he comes home and almost reverts uh, to an infantile uh, fetal position. He stays home five years and then just begins to emerge. He's very quiet at home and hiding and staying in bed and referring or comparing himself to Howard Hughes and not doing much. He's staying in that house or in the apartments in the Dakota. Uh, and she's out buying property. I might say that uh, six days before John Lennon was murdered, Yoko bought a $450,000 farm in Virginia and another $350,000 home in Virginia, right in the heart or nest of the intelligence community. I uh, would love to see a map and see if it's near Edwin Wilson's house or John Warner, Senator John Warner. But she plunked down a big hunk of money, uh, he saw one home. It was bought in April. She, he never saw the other one. She managed the finances, and he stayed in the house. And he didn't emerge again until later uh, when she, as I say, had him hypnotized, and he came home and was a good boy. But when John got back to Yoko, then the wheel started turning again, if you put it into chronological order. And it turns out that the Turple Wilson case appears According to Jack Anderson, good morning, America. This is September the 24th of this year. My Justice Department story says that the name of Strom Thurmond, the crusty Southern, Southern Cal South Carolina senator, turned up in the Turple Wilson case. Investigators are checking into a possible connection of former Thurmond aide and these two renegade agents. Here's the story. A government witness charged that Frank Turple met in 1976 in the office of Strom Thurmond with a man called the Preacher. His real name is R.C. Whitner, W-H-I-T-N-E-R, and C is for church. His middle name is Church. And the Preacher was the top aide of Strom Thurmond. And uh, Wilson's partner, Turple, was in the office with Strom Thurmond and when asked about this, uh, Thurman said, well, he did know Edwin Wilson. And Wilson, of course, is the man that set up 127 dummy fronts for Navy intelligence and for Task Force 157 and organizations all over the world, including that Tursum in Geneva. So just the exact time that John Lennon is back with Yoko, the Thurman connection comes in again, and they Turple and Wilson are with Strom Thurmond. Now, I don't think they were there to send uh, weapons to Gaddafi. They may say, well, we want to send uh, some weapons over to Gaddafi, some transport planes. I don't believe that Strom Thurmond was sending that rascal Gaddafi airplanes. I think that Wilson and Turple and their connections to Robert Vesco and to the assassination teams and to the route that Mark David Chapman had talked more about John Lennon and they talked about weapons for Gaddafi. I think that's all a cover. Now, in 1970, Richard Nixon sent out a memo that has been documented. Uh, we cannot accept the election of Salvador Allende to be president of Chile. He told the National Security Council to get moving on that. And in 1970 was the time that the COINTEL program was put in by Tom Charles Houston starting in 68 to get the rock musicians, to get John Lennon and to get the hippies and the anti-war protesters. And from 1970 to 72 with John Mitchell until Watergate came and then John Dean told us about those programs, Richard Nixon had set into motion in California starting in 1969 with Altamont and I also have a connection of that John Ellsworth, not only to the Egyptian uh, group and the killing at Aldermont when they made the movie Give Me Shelter, but working for the Secret Service and the FBI and also in Beirut, Lebanon, where, Chat where uh, Mark David uh, Chapman was who killed John Lennon. So the same year that Richard Nixon is saying, set the wheels out, we can't accept uh, Allende's presidency in Chile, and they begin the arrangements to kill Andy is the same time that they were making the arrangements to wipe out the musicians after uh, the Woodstock Carnival and the Aldermont, and that was the end of the music scene. And uh, by 1972, as I say, Strom Thurmond was telling John Mitchell, let's do something now. It would be expedient to move on him now. It would save us time later. Now, when he Nixon called on 
his team to kill Allende, the team that he was working with, Edwin Wilson and Vesco and Turple all worked with uh, Mr. Allen, Richard Allen, in the same way the COINTEL program, uh, Mr. William Casey and Richard Allen and the entire White House and the Plumbers team and Robert Vesco were all involved in that, particularly the Hollywood angle with uh, Robert Hall and Jack Eggers of the Beverly Hills Police Department that worked with Vesco and Vesco worked with Richard Allen. Now, the Theodore Shackley group, as I say, was bringing in people from Laos and Vietnam, and at Fort Chaffee is where Mark David Chapman was working with them. In Miami, there was uh, a assassination team set up called J.M. Wave by Theodore Shackley, brought from Germany, and they worked with Frank Sturgis, involved with the Kennedy assassination, and Richard Allen, when I go into his biography for you year by year, if I don't have time this week, I'll continue it next week. Uh, this gang was working with Richard Allen very closely. And at the same time, down in Miami, uh, was uh, Mark David Chapman. At first, when he was arrested in New York, they had a fingerprint and identification of some crime in Florida that he was involved with. And then they quick hushed that up and said, oh, no, we've mistaken the wrong person. But his father lives in Florida, and there's even a bigger story in Florida going on now of Richard Allen that has an overlay of these particular years in 1976 that I'll go into in one minute. This assassination team were working with Mitchell Werbel in DeKalb County in uh, Georgia, in Atlanta, Georgia, and training assassins and working with the assassination teams of Lucian Conan and the uh, group that worked from, as I say, from John Kennedy up through tomorrow. Mitchell Werbel has sold one company and he's moved to Texas and uh, he has training, he's been training these private mercenaries and hit teams with silencers to go all, all, all over the world. And the place that Mark David Chapman started, he went to junior high, junior college rather, at DeKalb County. He had training to shoot. He took a lesson to be a security guard. He learned to use weapons at DeKalb County before he ever went to Beirut, Lebanon. The assassination teams of John Kennedy and Robert Kennedy were involved with art galleries and coin collecting and international narcotics and a network that went from Chile to the PLO and Lebanon and Hawaii and the same kind of contacts Mark David Chapman had at art galleries and art collections and uh, his consuming interest in art galleries and his traveling and being located at the exact places where these other fellows worked. Now, Richard Allen works for the National Security Council. He has strong Japanese contacts, and he set up a corporation called Potomac International that I'll go into, and involved in the other uh, uh, story, the Japanese connections that are many that I'll run down for you, of, uh, I think, Yoko Ono and Gloria Abe and the uh, unknown clients of Richard Allen and William Colby over in Japan are the answer to who killed John Lennon because if you take these names and put them in a sequence, the places where they were located at the particular time, the cities and the dates, which I have done, I can believe that the December 8th meeting of these people had more to do, as I say, with delivering John Lennon than it had to do with anything else that was going on in Washington at the time. When they met in January, Lennon was gone and he was no more challenged. And then the war cries of Alexander Haig and Richard Pipes and, and uh, the entire uh, Reagan's administration began, you know, escalating until the, hopefully maybe they can pull a war with somebody like Nicaragua or El Salvador or Libya. They're dying for this war. And I, I think they may have a war this time and nobody will come, but that's what they want to have. Now, there was a story in the Los Angeles Times in addition to the item about the big gift that Richard Allen had. Richard Allen had an apartment in Florida that he didn't tell the White House about as if they didn't know. The only one who didn't know was us. Fred Fielding, who was the man who told the press that the FBI had cleared Richard Allen, actually owns a half of a condominium apartment with Richard Allen in Florida. And they bought this down there on Sanibel Island, January the 1st, 1976, as partners. 
and they bought it from a Viscount Jose Butello, a businessman from the Azor Island. They were going to establish a business district in the Azores on behalf of Robert Vesco. Uh, Richard Allen is linked in, in every way with Robert Vesco, which is the international narcotics market, but also the assassination teams. I want to make it clear that he isn't just a businessman. He has been linked to those people who have been pulling assassinations for so long that I, it terrifies me to think that on December the 8th, the day that John Lennon died, is when he's making contacts with his friends overseas. Uh, if you, uh, there are many books on Robert Vesco, and this is the partner of uh, Richard Allen, the head of our National Security Council. One of the best books that I refer to all the time is that one, Spooks, by Jim Hogan. And Jim is writing a book, I understand, on Frank Turpel now, Goodness knows if Turpel is alive. Turpel and Coca-Cola disappeared three weeks ago after being on 60 Minutes. In the index uh, of just the book Spooks, it says there's a section on Robert Vesco, a section on Richard Allen and Vesco, the CIA and Vesco, Duvalier and Vesco, Bobby Hall, and that is the Regan connection, uh, the Hollywood connection to Michael Regan, Jack Eggers, the Beverly Hills Police Department, Investment overseas, that Vesco connection, Richard Nixon and Vesco organized crime and Vesco Paradise Island and Mitchell Werbel and Vesco. And Werbel, as I say, is DeKalb County. And there's an interwoven uh, connection, inter not interwoven, what word should I say? It, it, interwe it interweaves throughout the atlas when you take the places of where these people were and what they were doing and all the purposes of the names that I'm mentioning, as I said a year ago on this program, are for the purpose of assassinations. These are not businesses per se. These are hit teams that have set up offices and where they go, people die, whether they set up an office in Egypt and Sadat dies or office in Australia for um, uh, Allende's murder or Orlando Letelier's murder. And I believe also it had a strong link to Guyana and the Jonestown murders. That's one reason Jonestown hasn't been opened up or investigated because of this tangled web. But wherever these people went, there were deaths. It was Los Angeles, the Ambassador Hotel, and Robert Kennedy was killed, or up at Chaffaquiddick when Mary Jo Kopechny was killed, and so forth. There's strong links with these deaths. Now, Mark David Chapman, as I say, was at Fort Chaffee at the military base there with that David Moore in 1975, and he's with the same man in Geneva, Switzerland in 1978. He came back and he went, after his Beirut trip, he went to a Presbyterian college in um, um, Tennessee, and at that time he met a woman named Jessica Blankenship, and she took him to the Presbyterian college in Tennessee, but he when he goes to Hawaii and wants a trip around the world and goes to a travel agency and as soon as he kills John Lennon he calls his wife and she says to the press the first remark is I am a Presbyterian uh, she's a Japanese woman she made it quite clear I am a Presbyterian and he had come from that Presbyterian college in Tennessee to Hawaii and then before he killed John Lennon he went to Atlanta, Georgia. He went from Hawaii to Atlanta, Georgia to New York in November, then back to Hawaii and then to Atlanta and then to New York to the Dakota where he killed John Lennon. And when he went to Atlanta, Georgia on December the 6th and 5th and 6th, he again saw the same woman, Jessica Blankenship, that he saw at the Tennessee uh, College before he went to Hawaii. Uh, it was a Presbyterian college. He, he marries a Presbyterian or goes through that service, and she's the one that sends him around the world where these contacts are made. And he keeps contact with these people, David Moore two different times and Jessica Blankenship two different times, and both times are crucial. And the state of Tennessee is important. Uh, this Covenant College in Tennessee is important. Albert Osborne from the Defense Department who traveled to Mexico with Lee Harvey Oswald had dual citizenship in London, the United States, and home base was Tennessee and also in Texas. The Tennessee Valley is the area where the atomic energy 
uh, commission for NASA gave Joseph Mengele, the Nazi war criminal, money to experiment on 200 people who died of overdose of radiation in Tennessee. Tennessee is where Martin Luther King was killed. James Earl Ray is there. Uh, money from Wells Fargo Bank at the time the scandal of 23 million missing. Harold Smith says it involves two to three hundred million. And out of Hollywood branch of the Wells Fargo Bank, 5.3 was missing a million in Tennessee. And that's been hushed up and not investigated. And of course, Senator Howard Baker of the CIA and William Colby were very thick through Watergate and covered up the team like uh, Richard Allen and William Casey and John Mitchell and Robert Vesco. Uh, they covered all that up in 1972, 73, 74. Howard Baker is from Tennessee. So the, the overlapping of names of his seeing that same woman from the Presbyterian College in 1975 and seeing her again in 1980, seeing the Fort Chaffee friend from 1975, seeing him in 1978 in Geneva, Switzerland. I think these are key people to setting up the route of Mark David Chapman that he ends up knowing exactly where John Lennon stayed. Now, the hour is just about over, and I do not have time to uh, go over the chart with you in this hour on Richard Allen. He's a very important man. He's important... Uh, in many ways, and I have not done one hour biography on him oh, for many reasons, just a lack of time. There's been so many news stories breaking every week. But because of his contact on December the 7th and December the 8th in 1980, the night that John Lennon was murdered, and because of his importance in his uh, clients in Japan, that he had more clients than had to do with motor companies for the National Security Council. And because of Richard Allen's links to Robert Vesco and the assassination teams that have been working from Dallas up to the present, it's important to get the chronology of Richard Allen of who he is. He and William Casey are very important. So uh, if I don't do it this week, what I'll do is next week, take the charts I have for you on Richard Allen and take the charts on Mark David Chapman and do part two on the John Lennon murder and show the overlaying uh, locations of the particular agents of Allen at the time that uh, um, Chapman was moving around. One point about Richard Allen, which is important before I go off the air, is after he graduated from college from Notre Dame, he was, that was 1957 to 58. He was at Notre Dame getting a BA and an MA. He was part of a Helm Foundation called a study group from 1958 to 1960. Now, the year 1957 on is when the Cold War really escalated and Eisenhower was in office and Richard Nixon as vice president uh, getting ready to run for president in 1960 and they thought he would and the Bay of Pigs would be in 1961. Richard Allen takes two years off to go to Europe. He said he went for a uh, degree, a doctor's degree, and he told various people he had a doctor's degree, but he had lied. He didn't have a doctor's degree. He was there from 1959 to 1960. Now, 1959 to 1960 is when Otto von Bolschwing, the Nazi who set up the Galen uh, group in the United States that was involved with the murder of John Kennedy, was in Europe under the protection of Elmer Bobst and Richard Nixon's um, great uh, benefactors. So that the same years that he goes to Europe, Otto von Bolschwang, to take his position and accumulate a great amount of capital from a world Nazi network that was set up, Richard Allen is in Germany in 1959 and 1960 in Munich, Germany. He goes 1960 to 61, rather, and Bolschwang is there 59 and 60. So with those connections and with a lot more to come next week on this program, I'll do part two on who killed John Lennon and how they are related to the past murders of John Kennedy and Robert Kennedy, Martin Luther King, Malcolm X, and going right up to Anwar Sadat by next week. There may be another major one. We'll see. But we'll continue with this next week so you understand how they successfully did away with John Lennon. In the meantime, this is Mae Brussel in Carmel, and I'll be back with you next week.